We had no such difficulty getting a few words out of Damien McBride today. He is here in Brighton, uh, although he hasn't actually been given a pass which would allow him into the conference. So I met up with him this morning and began by asking how much money he'd made from the book. I've done well out of writing this book um, and, you know, I, I make no great apologies for that. I mean, that's, that's the amount that was uh, paid for it. I've also given the royalties from actual sales of the book to charity, uh, partly so that, you know, people, people buying it that might not want to put any money into my coffers, at least they know that's going to a good cause. But the serialisation, people are talking about six-figure sum. Uh, yeah, I think you know I've seen that reported, um, and you know it is around that level. So after the publishers have their share and the taxmen have their share, I'll, I'll do quite well out of it. These confessions of yours, I mean, are, you're a, a Roman Catholic, I believe. I mean, are, do you believe you did wrong? Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, did seriously wrong, and affected many people's lives in a in a hugely damaging way, and and you know lots of those people were politicians who know the kind of rough and tumble of politics. Some of them were you know quite bruisers themselves but lots of them were totally innocent civil servants. And one of the things that's been particularly painful this week is reading some of the reactions from people who were, you know, ordinary civil servants or advisors to uh, those ministers, you know, reacting with a bit of horror, frankly, about what, what they've read. I mean, you know, I've been in this world for a long time, as you have. I mean, what surprised me was you admit that so much of what you did was friendly fire. I mean, doing in people on your own side. Yeah. Um, and and Part of that, I mean, you know, I could have, I could have said lots, and I do say lots in the book about the um, what my operations against the Conservative Party, both legitimate ones and and. But that uh, was what was that was what was exceptional. That it wasn't about furthering the Labour cause; it was about furthering Gordon Brown. Yeah, but I think I think in some ways that reflects the period that we went through. Um, you know, of which I was only parts, uh, you know, in later years, from 1997, where because the Labour Party was so dominant in government, because the Conservative Party wasn't really getting a look in, then it almost became this sort of, you know, internal struggle was the only debate in politics. And, and that was a serious struggle at times, a serious debate about sort of policy direction of, of the Labour Party. But it was really about Gordon Brown wanting the top job, wasn't it? Well, it was about Gordon Brown, you know, over, over the years having control over vast areas of government and ultimately about him succeeding Tony Blair. But, I mean, anybody basically who was a threat to his ambitions, uh, you went out and tried to squash. John Reid, Cherie Blair, Charles but, Clark, I mean, yeah, lots, I think lots, the lots the of rivals. Yeah, but as I'm saying, the difference is I felt that those people were not only rivals to Gordon Brown, not only threats to Gordon Brown's succession, but were actively engaged in trying to undermine him and, you know, trying to take him on. I mean, someone like Charles Clark was a sort of, you know, very, very active critic of Gordon Brown, a very damaging critic. But to be clear, I mean, you know, as you go into the book, when you had to resign, it was about thinking about disseminating lies about prominent Conservatives, wasn't it? it uh, unsubstantiated stories, but um, that was, yes, that no, was lies. something... They were unsubstantiated stories. Well, they, they were not things, things you made up. No, they, they weren't. They were, they were, no, I made very clear in the book that they weren't things I was made up. They were things that I was told by people and sort of, you know, believed at the time. Obviously, they turn out to be unsubstantiated, but that I, I certainly wasn't in the business of making things up. And amidst all the things that have been said about me, there are very few, other than the few that I've admitted to in the book, which could generally be described as sort of, you know, either making up lies or, or um, you know, spreading false rumours about people. But even after you resigned in 2009, Gordon Brown stayed in touch with you. Not really. No, no, no. I mean, we didn't have any uh, verbal contact at all from the moment I resigned until um, after he left office. The only thing I had in that whole time was a, a voicemail from him asking if my mum and my girlfriend were OK. Let's be clear about this. You felt licensed by him to do what you did. No, I didn't feel, I didn't feel licensed by him. I felt that I had a freedom to operate in the way that I did. And that was entirely because of what intelligence I was able to bring back to him and the sort of contacts that I was able to bring back to him um, from parts of the media that uh, other Labour politicians couldn't reach. But, you know, I've had conversations with Gordon Brown. He was paranoid about people briefing against him, as he used to put it, which suggests to me that he knew that he was quite capable of briefing against others. I think it was more that when Gordon Brown would see stories like that, he would always have a very clear idea in his own mind who had been responsible for them. And so over the years, you know, he, I'd hear him say, sort of, that must be Mandelson or that must be uh, Tessa or that must so be... So Gordon Brown never said to you, such and such a Labour politician is a threat to me, let's see what we can do about it. No, never. Never, absolutely not. Never. And he didn't know what you were doing. No. And so the only times that you'd ever have any kind of discussion like that was when there was an active coup in, in motion. So when there were discussions, for instance, around uh, David Miliband in August 2008 when he wrote his article, uh, which was sort of seen as firing the gun as a bit of a potential leadership uh, threat. What are these emails that you think may be around that uh, Ed Miliband would be well advised to destroy? 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was just reporting what was said to me at the time that when I sat down with Derek Draper and uh, you know, and he said that there might be this problem with these uh, red rag emails. He also said, I, I asked him, you know, who else could have a problem, and, and he said Peter Mandelson, James Pennell, Ed Miliband. Now, when the Peter Mandelson emails to Derek Draper came out, they were just, you know, they were reasonably innocuous. They were just about Gordon having an image problem, that kind of thing. So they weren't, they weren't sort of anything of the scale that I was up to. So I would imagine that what he meant from James Pennell and, uh, and Ed Miliband was just, you know, personal contact of stuff that, you know, might be a little embarrassing because it's giving your personal views. Well, they were spreading rumours, in other words. No, 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 no. I don't think it would have been anything like that. And that's not, you know, Ed Miliband is not that sort of person. It's not the way he operates. So Ed Miliband didn't know what you're doing either? No. Not so well. The, the, the point at which Ed Miliband concluded that, um, you know, that I was a bad thing and I needed to be got rid of was when he assumed wrongly that I was briefing against him after the election never was in 2007. And that's when he sort of turned on me and, and as time went on, became one of those people that were saying to Gordon Brown, you have to remove him from uh, this press briefing. Where does this leave you now? Uh, it leaves me having told my story, which is something I wanted to do, and um, you know I'll go on my life. I've got no ambitions to get back into politics, and haven't really for you know since since I left. Really? Well, no, and, and I say I say in the book that I don't think I was suited to that life, or certainly it became something that was very corrosive uh, for me over time. And I'm, I'm not blaming politics for that, but certainly the longer I was in the system, the worse my behaviour became.